A good day to everyone. A warm welcome to this third day of the Africa Europe Foundation's Africa Forum, where we have been discussing a number of strategic issues in the relationship between Africa and Europe, but also the things that matter in commonality between them. Today, we're turning our attention to cities and how cities can provide the linchpin for a new narrative for stronger Africa-Europe partnerships. We have a number of mayors, we have a number of uh, key contributors who've been involved in the scene around um, cities and other other matters. We have politicians for you, uh, foundation leaders, etc. So it should make for a very effective conversation around how we build on and catalyze and scale up partnerships between cities uh, in Europe and Africa. And, and I suppose the central question here is, are they the unit of governance that works best in creating multilateral, cross-region, cross-continent uh, collaborations that work? And can they, do the, can they be the area in the space that can really energise a different kind of momentum to supporting and, and, and I suppose, responding to people's lives and livelihoods? Um, so that's what we're what we're talking about today. Um, for those of you who are uh, Zoom savvy, uh, should know that you should have your screen on and your title, and keep muted. If you wish to raise a question, please don't hesitate to do so. But use your virtual hand. You'll find that under the participants icon, and you'll find it there. You can just raise that. That alert me to the fact that you want to come on and raise a question, a query, or just share a thought and idea. Uh, we also have this live streamed, and I'm really pleased to welcome those who are watching us on live stream. And you are not forgotten or not included. If you wish to raise a question or an issue, go uh, log, uh, log your query on hashtag Africa Europe Foundation and we'll uh, um, aim to take as many of you as we can in this conversation which will be far reaching and we have uh, quite some time to be able to dig in uh, deep into some of the issues. So thank you all. Those are the, them are the rules of the game. I would also encourage those of you who are on Zoom to use the Zoom chat. We find it really effective ways of be people being able to share ideas, thoughts, and if we run out of time, actually raise questions and queries. We always keep that data, and we make sure that we're able to collate it, uh, use it for thought-provoking ideas in the future, but also I'll respond to questions and queries you may have about the work of the Africa Europe Foundation, but also wider matters in relation to our speakers. Um, so there we are. Um, my name is Amendra Kanani. I'm Chief Spokesperson at Friends of Europe. And it firstly gives me great pleasure to invite a, a mayor who has done a number of uh, fantastic things. Um, and we've had her as a regular on uh, some of our Africa Europe debates. And also, also, it gives me great pleasure to say that, Yvonne, you'll be joining uh, the High Level Working Group um, of the Africa Europe Foundation. So thank you for joining that august group. And you will make a, a great contribution given uh, where you're coming from, what your issues are, but also it demonstrates our commitment to locality and making sure that locality is wired into the work of the Africa Europe Foundation. So Yvonne, tell us, you've been doing some incredible things uh, that are connecting cities around a range of issues, not least sustainable, inclusive growth and how cities can be the new vector for a, a different kind of collaboration that actually gets to the parts that others don't. So Yvonne, over to you first to share with us what, what you've been doing. And I suppose, um, what can be done to elevate or leverage or catalyze what you do to a different level? Yvonne, warm welcome. Thank you so much, Damendra. I really appreciate this. And I just want to also acknowledge this morning and give my thanks to Mayor Soa of um, Accra, who um, has been doing a lot of this work with me. We've been doing this together, taking this initiative forward together. Um, of course, the Africa Europe Foundation, ODI, and great to be on this panel with other speakers. Um, you, thank you. You mentioned already that uh, I've had the privilege um, of being invited to become a member of the African Europe Foundation High Level Group um, and also of the Women Leaders Network. And I'm really delighted to accept that invitation and consider it an honor to be part of um, this network. So today, I'm really pleased that we have this opportunity to talk together and look at the role that mayors can play. Um, and, you know, as we consider the strengthening of collaboration across the continents, Africa and Europe, in what many people are describing as a post-COVID context, but which I want to remind us all um, 
is in some areas and Sierra Leone and other African countries are case in point, an ongoing COVID context as the third wave that we are experiencing is now more virulent um, than the first and the second. But that not set, notwithstanding, um, we can still focus on what this collaboration means. So the past year has clearly shown, uh, and I think more in more ways than, than ever before, the importance of forging a global cooperation and the need for us to find common solutions to these global challenges. And whether it's pandemics, as COVID has you know, put into such, such sharp focus, or climate change, which we can't afford to lose sight of, or indeed migration, which is impacted by the first two. Um, and you say in your introduction, what is the role? Can the cities be a new vector? And I think the answer is yes. I think cities can chart a path forward by supporting and jointly developing practical approaches that deal with the realities that we face across Africa and Europe um, in, in respect of these big topics. So that is why myself and my dear friend, the mayor of Milan, Mayor Pepe Sala, initiated the mayor's dialogue. And the, in, the idea here was to create an innovative platform for us mayors and cities, which will enable us to work together across Africa and Europe and to advance cooperation between our cities, within our cities, and consequently between our continents. And I'm really pleased to inform you that today, more than 20 mayors from across the two continents have joined us. Um, and there are a number of them who can't be present today, and we just, will, just want to acknowledge acknowledge them and the role that they're playing. Um, an example of what we mean by mm. practical, a practical approach. So at the heart of the challenges of migration, for example, um, there are many factors, but one that I often ask that we do not lose sight of are the structural deficiencies, the structural issues, which are factors which persist in a number of the, the countries which are the originating countries of migrants, met, most of which is rooted in um, opportunities or the lack thereof for growth and for jobs. So what we're doing between Milan and Freetown mm -hmm. is building a platform in using fashion as a common denominator, as a common um, area of focus. Milan is well known for its fashion. Um, Freetown has its own fledgling but very dynamic fashion industry um, and creating the space for fashion entrepreneurs in my city to have access to markets in Milan will re result in jobs, real jobs, being created in Freetown. So that's a practical in example. So we're testing innovations to support the transition to a green recovery. We, you know, here in Freetown are, um, Freetown, the tree town, the planting of a million trees um, means that we're creating jobs for tree stewards, tree monitors, but we're also by the virtue of the actual jobs that we, um, trees that we're planting, there's the indirect benefit of more growth of, of trees for market, um, fruits for market, output for market. Other cities on the continent and beyond, Canifig in the Gambia being an example, um, we are sharing experiences and we're learning from each other. And we are happy to support them and they're happy to support us. So that's what we talk about in terms of these uh, building the dialogue within the continent as, a, as in addition to across the continent. Um, so we're eager to look at examples that are, are applying innovative and green financing instruments as well at the municipal level, because having the money to, to actually make a green just recovery a reality is, um, you know, can't be over under, overestimated, the importance of that. So the cooperation between us, African and European cities, goes beyond the region and makes a contribution to global movements and efforts. I'm proud to say that um, as a recent new vice chair of C40 City Steering Committee, for example, we're elevating the voices of cities in the fight against climate change. Earlier this month, as we bring these different sectors and issues together, I joined a group of mayors from Barcelona to Dakar, Los Angeles and Milan to establish a global mayor's task force on climate and migration in partnership with C40 cities and the Mayor's Migration Council. 
So ahead of next year's AU-EU summit, Mm. we are asking for others to join us in giving cities a seat at the table. We want to create a different future for our communities and our societies. And we're asking national governments to have their cities participate. This is a very specific ask. We're asking national governments to have cities participate in their delegations as allies in achieving national goals. We're keen to work with the international system to reinforce the voice and agency of cities via access to financing. So as I said earlier, we can actually deliver the the results on the grounds. We are the best implement, the best instrument, the best tool, but we actually require the financing in order for us to execute our work. So we also call on public and private actors to willingly invest in practical experiments that test innovation between and within cities, innovations such as the one I described earlier, so that we can see what is most successful and we can ensure that we scale these up. So the Mayor's Dialogue is offering a platform to turn all of this into reality building on many decades of collaboration between African and European cities and ensuring that we we can actually at this critical time in this decade of a difference, as so many people refer to it, we make the most of this opportunity for city to city collaboration in order to help us achieve global goals. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you so much, and also congratulations on top of you know you becoming member of the high level work the uh, high level working group, the women's leadership network, but uh, vice chair of C C forty as well. So clearly powering on a number of levels here, and really uh, being able to um, knit together a group of passionate uh, civic leaders into a moment a, mom- a movement of change. I think we'll hear more about how we can then esca- how can how can we, how can this be helped to be elevated further. But well I want to move to our next mayor c- contributor and that's Mohammed. Mohammed thank you very much for joining us. A warm welcome to you mayor of Accra. Can you hear me? You need to go on uh, unmute. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, let me say a very um, good morning to, to my colleague, um, Mayor Aki, uh, a very instrumental uh, leader on the African continent uh, um, who has championed a lot of initiatives, which I'm very, very, very proud of. Uh, um, a big um, collaboration, which creates a platform of a dialogue between Europe and uh, in African cities, uh, it's very laudable and very important for us to share knowledge and um, experiences and also to support each other. Um, in Accra, for instance, um, um, one of the key things that we're looking at is the informality of our city. Um, if you have a city where uh, 80% of your um, workforce are in the informal sector mm. and 90% of new jobs that are created comes from the informal sector, then it's very important for you to, to critically look at the, the contributions of the informal sector and how we manage the informal sector for us to do. Beyond that, it's also key for us to look at the issues of um, infrastructure has been the bane of uh, the African cities. For instance, on issues of climate change, whereas African cities are looking at issues of adaptation, um, the uh, um, European cities are looking at issues of uh, uh, mitigation. Why? Because in Africa, issues of adaptation um, comes because of lack of infrastructure. And for me, it is critical for us to look at generally infrastructure. Um, today, joint forces with a couple of um, um, uh, uh, local authorities for the citywide operation on how to support the informal sector to mm. let it grow and mm. help the city. Because over the years, the thinking of, um, uh, of, of city managers has been that uh, the informal sector as a troublesome sector, they are unregistered, they cannot be taxed and all. 
effort has not been made to reach out to the informal sector to get that. So, for instance, the issue of uh, getting everybody a task identification number so that we can get everybody registered, and also the the GPS system that has also been introduced, and everybody is being registered and getting a national identification. So this is being done mm. at the national level. And for us at the local level, in our quest to build a city which is livable and resilient, then it's very important to look at the informal sector as well because a lot of their contributions are what makes the city also get flooded. Accra experience flooding every year. But with the effort that has been put in, making sure that the informal sector understands that their activities also contribute to the flooding. Last year, and hopefully this year, there hasn't been any serious flooding in Accra. And we have made sure that we mainstream all our climate activities in the, uh, in, in the general program that we have in the city. So Accra is seen as a city where um, uh, climate activities um, is it's, it's a learning ground for every facet of our life, what you do, whether you are a fisher folk, you are, you are an ordinary farmer, you are a, uh, a trader in the market and everything, they are all part of it. And that, for me, is very key. Uh, I'll, I'll be more than willing to listen to the discourse and learn more and as we share our experience. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity and sorry for the bit of distraction. Um, that's <laughs> an emergency. <laughs> no, we're sorry that you know you made time despite being in that situation. But also, it was actually different to have you walking through where you are and give us that visual uh, uh, background. It's, it's making it real for all of us. So no, thank you. And you made that a really important point. Which and my my question, I'm sure other question people have that question, but I need to move on. Is about what do you do? What can what can city mayors coming together do about the informal labour market? But also. What kind of role can they play in actually getting infrastructure sorted? Is that not a national responsibility? How can mayors really collaborate to get... Because one of the biggest issues when you think about urbanisation in Africa, but also in Europe, it, Europe, there's adaptation issues. Um, but in Africa, it's about how do you create the infrastructure to create the urban agenda that's going to be so powerful? So uh, those are kind of key questions in my mind. I'm sure you'll have others. Please do use the Zoom chat if you've got other thoughts in reaction to what you've heard. Mohammed, thank you. I'm going to move on to Louise. Louise, um, uh, who is a member of a high-level working group. Louise, um, thank you for being with us. I know you need to leave, and I was quite keen to make sure that you get an opportunity to reflect on what you've heard. You've been, you know, you've heard the conversations we've had so far over the days, but also just now what we're hearing from two significant mayors who are charging the lead on innovation and collaboration. Um, what can, you know, what's your reflection of what they're saying, but also the role of the Africa Europe Foundation in that regard? So, um, thank you very much. Uh, I, first of all, I wish to apologize as uh, I'm expected at the forum, not too far from my office here in Paris in about uh, 25 minutes. Um, I want to, to, to say this. I'll be very brief, but I'll make sure to give my views in writing so that we can record some of the um, uh, good collaborative efforts that we have noticed uh, at the level of my organization. So I am head of uh, the La Francophonie, which is a, a multilateral organization that uh, has 88 um, countries and uh, 88 uh, states and, and, and governments uh, around the world with the second largest group of uh, countries after the United Nations. And, and I, have ob I have observed um, from the experience of the International Association of Francophone Mayors, um, an organization that uh, groups about 400 mayors slash cities um, 300 around the world, cities slash mayors, and um, it was created back in 1979. So it's got quite um, a life uh, of, of experience in exchange and collaboration between uh, and amongst uh, cities. And um, we are present uh, in 54 countries around the world and work with close to 130 million uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. 
So let me say this uh, first and foremost from, from where I sit, which is in the multilateral international world. We have got to um, create agility in the way we do business. For the, the wonderful things that have been said by the two mayors uh, whom I salute uh, from my own continent, mm -hmm. um, the way we have been looking at what happens with the crisis recently, we, we all have been using the health crisis in the last year and a half, and I don't think it's a bad thing because it showed us how complicated or easy things can be depending on how we are ready to adjust and adapt. And, 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 and so from my perspective, before we even get to the collaborative uh, actions and mm -hmm. efforts, there has to be a change of mind mm -hmm. in the way we work in the international world. Um, and in my view, that means moving nicely away from the um, rules and uh, set of uh, um, uh, processes and 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 laws and that were created when the multilateral institutions were created mm. right after World War II mm. and realize that today what our citizens, which means the dwellers of our cities need is for us to be able to respond without having to refer to our rules and the way we do business and meetings of uh, heads of state and meetings of ministers. That for me is a very key thing. Are we ready to have the agility it mm. takes for us to be able to allow our cities to contribute to solving many of the problems we see in the world today? And many of these problems are actually seen in, in our cities. So the number one thing, we've got uh, to change the software of the international collaborative mechanisms. Mm. United Nations, the, my own organization, uh, La Francophonie, the Commonwealth, the uh, World Bank, IMF, regional uh, and, and continental organizations, the African Union. I think we have got to agree that to solve the problems of our citizens, meaning the problems that exist in our cities and the problems of the world, we have to be ready to adopt new rules or to bend the rules that exist so that we can go to the essential. And I really appreciated uh, what the, my sister, the mayor of Freetown said about developing practical solutions. Yes. When we go mm. to practical solutions, we have to have the tools and the mindset to go that way. That's number one. Number two, um, cities have a lot to contribute to um, uh, solving the problems of, I mean, the, the, the uh, reason for our own foundation to exist is to come and support the more classic, um, you know, let me be not nice and say rigid ways in which the, the world does business. We want to be able as a foundation to come in support of different activities without being bothered too much with the rules and the bureaucracy and just deliver the services to the citizens. So for me, cities can contribute okay enormously by creating links between cities, city to city collaboration is something that works, exchange of experience, saving some cities from what hasn't worked in other cities, um, projecting uh, development of, of cities, whether it's in, in, in providing water or electricity or, or managing sure. transportation of our citizens. These things have succeeded in some cities in Europe and in Africa. Can we put these cities together and make sure that Excellent. they share that experience? And we as a foundation actually mm -hmm. come um, and, and, 
and support them and mobilize them and open some doors with uh, countries that are our members, with uh, some of the multilateral institutions and, and so forth. So I wanted to make those two very uh, key points uh -huh. in my view. And, and then uh, conclude by saying that uh, the, this, this foundation to have adopted cities as a, a way to get to our objective, which uh -huh. is to create a different relationship between the two continents, a relationship with that complex, a relationship that is respectful, a relationship that solves the problems of our citizens. We have got to think differently. Thank you. Louise, thank you. Sorry, I had to cut you short. I have to cut, cut you short because there are so many other contributors and I'm already running out of time, so I do apologize. But you you provided some really powerful messages about agility, mindset, and I, you didn't say these are my words, a new form of multilateralism that works at a local level, potentially, which is faster, better, and able to make uh, the, the joins uh, work much more effectively. Thank you very much. I want to bring in Mo in a few, in a few moments' time, but before I do, I'm just going to share with you a video recording we have have of a message from Commissioner uh, Durovska Shucha, who has a number of responsibilities, but she's the Vice President for Democracy and Demography. And uh, here, here's she, what she has to say about the role of cities and their importance. Dear mayors, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to address you, the mayors of African cities here today at the first Africa Europe Foundation Forum. We will all agree that cities matter a great deal in the development of our societies, as well as a tangible example of the democratic process. While there are contrasts and our cities will grow at a different pace, the African and European continents share many similar opportunities and challenges pertaining to demography, climate change, global pandemics, including the current one we are all fighting together. Cities have been greatly impacted by COVID-19. Mayors were at the forefront of the response to this health crisis. They were and are the politicians who hear and see firsthand people's concerns, fears, and most pressing needs. Now, mayors play a key role in the post COVID 19 recovery. Having been a mayor myself for two successive terms, I have first-hand experience in just how effective mayors and cities are when it comes to implementing policies that have a direct impact on people's lives. Cities are a vital catalyst for generating ideas and initiatives contributing to the democratic processes. I truly believe that we can all benefit from strengthened cooperation between European and African cities. In direct response to the call by the mayors here today to reinforce the voice and agency of cities in the European Union and Africa, I would like to underline the following points and commit commitments. First, as we strengthen the partnership between European Union and Africa, we support the call for cities to be a place within the exchanges between the European Union and Africa. Within the international system, we need to reinforce the voice of cities. Second, we recognize the need for cities to be given greater space to act and contribute in decision making. This includes the creation of new opportunities for access to financing to deliver results on the ground and a citizen-centered bottom-up approach to regional cooperation. And the third, we look forward to working with Africa Europe Foundation to shape a meaningful engagement of cities and mayors, including the preparation of the next Talking Africa EU series focused on the theme of cities. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I wish you fruitful discussion at this event today. As I look forward to our cooperation, I hope to be in a position to engage with you in person very soon. Thank you. So, colleagues, um, some important um, uh, messages there from uh, co the Commissioner Suja. Uh, uh, obviously, Dubrovska couldn't be here, but we all, we have her head of cabinet uh, present, though. Um, very important signals about the role of cities, potential financing, etc. But we have something called the Conference on the Future of Europe that's currently underway, which will shape. Uh, theoretically shape the future of Europe in terms of its structure, content and purpose in the future. Um, Colin, it's good to have you with us. Hello. 
Um, Hello, good to have you. Good, good to be here. Thank you very much. No, thank you for being here. Could you just uh, expand a little bit further on what uh, Dubrovska said around the role of cities of finance, but more importantly, how does this fit this dialogue uh, amongst mayors and, uh, and wider on the Conference of the Future Europe? And what role could the Africa Europe Foundation play to help facilitate a better movement on this particular agenda? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to join this this meeting and this, this uh, really impressive uh, array of, of participants. Um, the vice president was very sorry that she couldn't uh, join uh, join herself, uh, but um, but uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to add a few words. Uh, I think I think in fact um, our portfolio, democracy and demography, and the various aspects that you mentioned and that the vice president herself mentioned, uh, you know, there are, there are many lines um, of uh, of contact with uh, with the objectives of the of this of this meeting and also of the process that there is behind it. Um, we, we've been working very very closely with uh, with local with regional authorities, uh, with cities, of course, with towns. Um, in uh, in all aspects of our portfolio, uh, both when we talk about demography and also democracy, most uh, notably in the context of the Conference of the Future of Europe, and the two are very intimately linked. Um, the priorities of this of this commission uh, for the for the coming uh, mandate for the next three and a half years uh, is predicated on on three main transitions, which are the the green transition, the digital transition, and the demographic transition. And all of these um, also I, I, uh, resonate in the in the context of uh, of Africa and the realities that Africa itself is experiencing. Um, and, and in fact, while we have a very rich dialogue, I think, between the European Union and Africa at various levels, I think there is a gap. And the uh, cities and local communities is the is the level at which we need to to uh, uh, to really foster this relationship and to to encourage more people to people and city to city uh, contacts um, to be able to learn from respective experiences. And uh, clearly, this is a two way street. It's not. It is certainly not a one way street. And certainly, in the vision of of the European Union and its uh, its, its uh, Africa strategy, this is very much a uh, a two way street. Um, cities give the opportunity to bring in civil society, grassroots organiza organizations, young people. Um, so, so there are opportunities which very often at the national level um, are, are missed or which perhaps might be rather all-encompassing, but don't go down to the, uh, to the real issues that affect people's lives on a, on a daily basis. Um, and this is very much what we're trying to, uh, to achieve through the conference uh, on the future of Europe, because we're trying to engage directly with citizens, with organizations as well, but very much um, giving a platform to citizens to express their views, to share their ideas, to, to tell us what their aspirations are and what kind of relationship they want with the European Union and what mm -hmm. kind of Europe they wish to have in the future. Colin, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt you a second? And, no, and you're making some very fine points, but I want to cut to the chase. We heard from Yvonne um, that actually what mayors want is a seat at the table and they want to be at the heart of policy-making processes. They want to be the shortcut for evidence-based policy-making in action. Can we see some of that happening in short from yourselves? Well, we're trying to, to build this, certainly in the European Union context. We can't necessarily export it wholesale to uh, no, anywhere else. That's up to, that's up to, uh, to each and every um, um, nation and uh, uh, multilateral body to, uh, to, to look at that. But I think that we can also learn some lessons uh, from this experience, from this experiment that we're, um, we're launching in Europe. And, uh, and hopefully there will be lessons to be learned that can be applied and can be, can be also useful to the experience of, uh, of other countries and other regions in the, in, in the world. Um, and this is where the deliberative angle, the participative angle, which which goes to to strengthen representative democracy, it's not not intended to replace it. Mm. It's there to bolster it and to to give it uh, give it a, a stronger uh, stronger foundation. But I think in that uh, in in that uh, effort. Um, local authorities, cities, towns, uh, city councils, communities um, can play a fundamental role because they are really the ones who are close to the needs and to the uh, to, to the real issues that affect people on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're seeing this through our experience, and I'm sure that uh, that this is the case uh, elsewhere. 
Um, and that's why I think that this is really a dimension that we need to find ways to introduce, even within the broader dialogue that we have between the European Union and, uh, and, and Africa. Uh, because, because I think that the experience that cities bring and the, uh, and the questions that they can pose are ones that we need to be answering. Um, we cannot uh, we cannot just look uh, you know have the helicopter view of, uh, of of issues. We really need to zone in to, um, to, to the local to the local level and and listen to to the real issues. Because at the end of the day, we'll find out that even people living in very different environments, on a day-to-day -day basis, have the same have the same concerns. Absolutely. It's about job security. It's about their healthcare. It's about education. It's about the air quality or, or, or environmental considerations that that have an impact on them. So so whether we're talking about uh, Scandinavia or uh, or, or uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, there are there are differences, of course. But I think many of the issues are actually Absolutely rather similar and need, and need to have the same solutions applied to them. And actually, it goes back to the point that was made by um, our previous speaker, Louise, about we need a different mindset and agility about how we solve problems, but also how we move decision making to be much more agile. And you speak to that. I will, before I bring in Marta, a shamelessly plug a paper that uh, Friends of Europe, as a founding member of the African European Foundation, two years ago produced something called A New Localism. And one of our colleagues will post it on the chat. I recommend it as a read because all the things you're saying are exactly what we felt was important to be developed in terms of the role of the European Commission and the new mandate, but also a wider look at how cities can play a much more effective role as being at the heart of evidence gatherers, but also in touch with what's happening to citizens. Um, and so we'll, one of our colleagues will share, uh, share that sense, that paper, which advocates a set of policy issues which I'm sure are, are uh, valuable and cross cutting across regions. I want to move to Marta, um, uh, Marta Foresti from the ODI. Thank you for being patient uh, with, with me um, as I've been dotting about some of the kind of contributions that, I'm, that I've been pulling in. Thank you for joining us. You're obviously a partner to this debate also. So thank you for that. Um, you were also going to say a few words uh, on behalf of Eda Kalau from the mayor of Barcelona who couldn't be here to join us. So um, you're fulfilling two hats and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tall order, uh, Marta, but thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, I'm very much looking forward to uh, to play mayor for a couple of minutes uh, in uh, in just a second. But before that, I just want to be the better of some very good news, particularly to Louise and to the vice president that we just heard and the chef of cabinet to say that in calling for greater collaboration between African and European cities and the need to create platforms from African and European cities and cats. To uh, collaborate um, more. Um, I love this moment of reality, you know, it's great. Shame That's I don't have a I child. Like I normally do have that too, but today I just <laughs> okay. have a cat. Um, so the good news is that uh, it is happening, it, it exists. And so much of the point that Louise made about agility and a different mindset, and let me add vision and a phenomenal amount of energy. Um, these 20 plus African and European mayors, led by Mayor Aki Sawyer from Freetown and Mayor Sala from Milan, only in 2019 came together and thought that the time was right for African and European mayors to start working together very practically, hands-on, looking for solutions. And fast forward in 2021, with the year that we just had, um, this platform, the Mayor's Dialogues of Growth and Solidarity, exists. It has 24 cities active, many more probably joining from large cities from Paris to Lisbon, um, 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 Kampala, um, and other major cities to Canifing, Bristol, Mannheim, um, and others, Durban, uh, and many more, Lisbon and Barcelona that you will hear uh, via my voice in a minute. So we do have an active and in fact, very energetic, pragmatic and pretty determined group of mayors, alliance of mayors across the two continents working together despite, um, and in fact, with the reality of COVID. We never met, but we managed in a year and a half um, to make some phenomenal progress and is a delight for ODI to host and support this platform. But I'm inviting all of you uh, to engage and reach out because uh, we really have an opportunity to quite rapidly, uh, and despite some of the limitations that Louise reminded us of international rules, really make fast progress, to bring not just the voice, but also the action of the cities at the heart of the Africa Union, of the Africa-Europe relations and with the eyes to the a UAU summit next year, there will certainly be a moment to actually materialize this presence 
of um, cities um, together with their governments um, at the table. Mm -hmm. So I touched on agility and energy. I mentioned some of the cities that are um, involved in the dialogue. I think in the chat, you have a link where you can find out more. I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the partners that support this dialogue and this initiative, the uh, Open Society Foundation and the Robert Bosch Foundations, who are providing much precious funding. You just heard Mayor Aki Sawyer reminding us how much cities need financing to be able mm -hmm. to deliver on these visions and ODI um, supporting the, the dialogue and the Mayor Migration Council as our partner. Um, and um, just the thought on what you asked us at the beginning, you continue to ask us about what can we do to elevate the role of the city? So first of all, is, is for the cities themselves to come together and take action that they have done and they're demonstrating they can land that pretty rat rapidly. Secondly, is money and the sit at the table. You heard about it. Mm. But thirdly, and this is where I'm very grateful to the Africa Europe Foundations, we need cities to engage, discuss and talk about influence together with other global leaders. And that, in my opinion, is not happening enough. There is too many conversations about cities that just happen with cities. We need cities to engage with the rest of the world, with all of you, all of us, to create that real change. And so I see this conversation today as the first step to continue with all of you and make progress. And now uh, let me stop and go back to listen to a mayor. If there is one thing I've learned in the last year working with mayors is that, and the cities, is that you need to let that it is for them to set the agenda and to, and to explain and to say what's needed and what to do. And so this is from Mayor Colau, who couldn't be with us today, but was very keen to share with you some thoughts. Thank you. Apologies that I'm not able to join in person, but I'm glad to contribute to this timely conversation about the future of our continents. I'm delighted that the essential contribution of African and European cities in tackling climate change, human mobility and other global challenges and opportunities is finally recognized. And I'm grateful to the Africa Europe Foundation and ODI for organizing the session. Cities are a decisive level of government and can reinvigorate the partnership between Africa and Europe by making progress in areas where cooperation between states is at times insufficient. Ahead of the AU-AU summit in 2022, this year offers a window of opportunity to kickstart a new chapter for relations between our two continents. City-to-city -city cooperation, whether bilateral or through networks, allows us to strengthen technical and institutional capacities linked to better local governance and the right to inclusive and sustainable cities. That is why the role of cities must be at the forefront of Europe-Africa relations. Cities must play a central role and represent the voices and needs of all of our residents while sharing good practice, knowledge and ideas on how to bring our communities and societies closer, emphasizing what unites our cities, countries and continents. Cross-border cooperation between cities in Africa and Europe is already happening and making fast progress. I'm proud to be working with fellow mayors across the two continents on the Mayor's Dialogue on Growth and Solidarity, a platform for action that can help states make progress on global goals and inform national policy on migration, climate and beyond. For example, Barcelona is working closely with the city of Dakar to tackle dangerous out-migration from the Senegalese coastline to Southern Europe. The partnership we are creating will support job creation opportunities in Dakar and labor market inclusion of Senegalese youth in Barcelona, working particularly closely with the Senegalese diaspora associations. Cities' challenges are deep and complex. They are structural and they are shared. Working to create sustainable, green and inclusive urban centers, as we are doing in Barcelona in cooperation, for example, with the city of Maputo, should be a priority across our continents. With your support and in partnerships with governments, regional organization and others, we can achieve so much more. I look forward to our future collaboration and actions to build a stronger and more equal partnership between Africa and Europe with cities at its heart. Marta and Ada, both of you, thank you very much and you're on her behalf. Uh, powerful words. And you know, there, there is something about <clears throat> turning some of those commitments and those um, uh, appropriate engagements of passionate civic leaders making things happen despite national politics or regional politics or cross-continental politics. And the question, the question I, I want us to address at some point, and I'm sure people have this, is that that thing about infrastructure, how can mayors help create the kind of infrastructure they need at a local level when much of it is national? And what role will we, will we see NATO, the other multilateral institutions, create 
a space for mayors. Because when you think about the economic hit and economic weight, the, the risk of cities uh, being su suffering cyber attacks, etc., can close down an economy. And we've seen cities being uh, at the brunt of the health crisis. So there are key questions here about multilateralism and infrastructure. But without further ado, I would like to move on to Mo. Mo Ibrahim, who is known to all of you, he needs no introduction. Um, he is a, a star like many of the people here, but he has a special place in our heart. Uh, Mo's been around this block for a very long time, and he's one of the co-founders of the Africa Europe Foundation. And I suppose I know him very little, but I've had the, I've had the you know, great opportunity to be uh, moderating with him over the couple of years. But I know that he has been singing this tune for a long time. He He's seen this agenda in various ways, and his foundation has led in dialogues across continentally. So, Mo, we're an exciting stage of Africa EU foundation and relations. Um, reflect on what you've heard, and does this feel like new music to you? Well, uh, thank you very much for the, your kind introduction. I, 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 first, I really wish to welcome and thank all our speakers and uh, the people who participated. Uh, <clears throat> this meeting. Uh, let me just say a word about the Africa Europe Foundation, uh, which we founded uh, a few months ago, actually. Oh, I think we've lost his signal. Uh, uh, you just come uh, back, Mo. Can you hear me? Now we can. You, okay. We, your signal just went down okay. very briefly. Go on, carry on. Sorry. Right. All what we do is we want to do is really create a platform to enable really a productive, frank, and honest dialogue between not only uh, European and uh, African institutions, which we do, but also between all the stakeholders, business, civil society, and now cities, uh, we really need to bring uh, uh, people uh, 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 around the table uh, to have this useful for discussions, but also it's not enough just to, to not trying to create a talk show. Uh, what we're trying to do really is, is to find a way uh, to, to, to inform policy making, uh, develop business model, and even promote certain projects. That's why we have these five strategic groups, uh, which is populated by 20, 30 uh, of, of uh, experts from both continents, uh, practitioners, academics, uh, uh, politicians. And uh, we will look at the areas, of course, uh, which are key for us, which are health, uh, sustainable energy, uh, sustainable agriculture, transport and infrastructure, and the digital economy. And all the stakeholders uh, really uh, have something in here. And a lot of these discussions at the strategic group levels, which is really about execution, about moving, getting things done, uh, uh, will can be useful really and, and to see how we can uh, move forward. Now, uh, I think cities are important. Uh, Africa also is, is urbanizing very fast. Cities uh, growing really rapidly in Africa. Uh, the stress on infrastructure is severe. Uh, the housing problem mm. is serious. More than 50% of the inhabitants of, of African cities actually live in informal settlements and slums. More than half don't have access to piped water. So there is a lot of pressure really on what needs to be done to really upgrade uh, uh, our city. So city planning is really important, how to move forward to ensure uh, the, 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 the viability and, 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 and uh, uh, that we, we really have livable uh, cities. Uh, I think it's really important uh, that we find a way for cities 
to have access to be able to finance itself also. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, people look at land and 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 property as a source of taxation, but we need to look also uh, for further way uh, to 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 how can we uh, get city to to access the capital markets mm -hmm. uh, in order to finance important projects. Uh, because situation differ from country to country, the support of, of the central governments to the local authorities varies, and uh, that includes the financial support. Uh, why is that important? Because I believe really mayors are a very important layer in the leadership, uh, because mayors and, and, and local authorities are in daily contact with people they have the, the issue of, of the challenges of daily life right in front of them, and they have to act. Uh, it's not like the remote central government, which can just bluff its way, etc. So cities and mayors, those are doers. And in many of the challenges we have, we can see cities at the forefront, even ahead of the government, uh, when it comes to climate actions, uh, 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 and, 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 and the various uh, uh, climate, by the way, one, one problem we need to deal with in Africa is the threat of the rising sea level mm -hmm. to some of the major cities in Africa. What, what our contingency plans is, what we're going to do there, that, that is uh, uh, also uh, is important. I'm aware of the pressure on time and we're already about 15 or 20 minutes late. I would like to stop here, but I once again, I really am grateful and thankful for, for the mayors and the speakers. Uh, and that's what we hope uh, to be able to continue this discussion. And again, we're not looking for a talking shop. Mm -hmm. We're looking, looking for action, getting things done. Absolutely. Thank you. Well said, and thank you for setting that tone for what happens as we move forward on this very important agenda. I want to, before I bring in um, the president of the development agency from Portugal, who's been very patient here, I want to go back to Yvonne, because I, uh, Yvonne, I know you're leaving uh, fairly shortly. Uh, you have to go, I believe. And I'd really want you to reflect on what you've heard so far before you do, in terms of some of the issues. Okay, um, so the I just want to say a big thank you to to Mo um, Ibrahim just now for um, just amplifying what we've been saying as city leaders um, and putting it so clearly. You know, we've got to react, we've got to respond, whether it's. Um, flooding or fires caused because of a lack of development control or lack of building permits um, devolved, being devolved to councils, whether it's um, national policies which support deforestation in places where it will result in landslides and, and um, whether it's the rising sea levels, whatever it is, you, you, the policies might be made somewhere, but the, the response, and in the case of our um, colleagues in Europe, very often these are around migration issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the response. You're the one on the beach. You're the one who has to house people. Um, so it's it's so critical that we we have a place at the table, and it's not for the sake of it. And I think it's it's the world is finding. When I say the world, um, the international, the, the the Bretton Woods institutions, the the multilateral institutions, as uh, Louise was saying earlier, they've been wired in a particular way, wired to deal with nation states, and in the same way that we're seeing transitions having to be made because of climate change. We've got to really think of an economy which is more green. It means invest. That, that, Disinvestment um, or divesting has to happen with fossil fuels, for example, more investment in renewables in the same way in which that very deliberate thinking has to be made because we're in this point of transition. There's also a need for deliberate thinking. What will this new world look like where cities have more of a role? Mm -hmm. And for those in, in national government, I can imagine that it sounds a bit scary, you know, mm -hmm. the seeding of power the letting go, but we've got to actually find something that works because what we have now is failing many of our residents, failing many of the citizens of our globe. Mm 
because there's too much of a gap between those who go to the big round tables, the big meetings, have the big conversations and sign the big compacts, the big documents, and then what fails to happen in reality. And, and, and what fails to happen in reality is affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of people, particularly on our continent, where poverty has increased um, with the with COVID, will continue to increase with climate, and we and we but yet we're having to at city level deal with this. We're not saying all cities are perfect. No, we're not yeah. saying all city leadership is perfect. But we're saying that there needs to be a form. There needs to be a new agenda, a new framework, mm. which actually closes the gap between what goes on in practice and what is defined in policy. It will make policy more more relevant, more effective, but most significantly, it will impact on lives. Uh, and, and so I think that that's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm hearing from colleagues, that we're seeing this in mm. bite sizes. How do we scale? How do we amplify what's, what's being done well? And for Africa in particular, how do we bring finance, ac make finance accessible mm. at the city level? Yvonne, thank you. And th I'm glad I brought you back. But, you know, you knit together some of the comments that have been had here. And I think perhaps you're, you joining the foundation in the various roles you have sp uh, speaks to what Mo and the other speakers have been saying is that perhaps the foundation can work in crafting this new infrastructure, this new multilateralism at city level. What does that look like? How should it behave? And what, how should it be supported? Perhaps that might be the action that Mo is referring to as well. It might be a great thing to be crafting for others to watch. I'm going to swiftly move on to Joao. Joao, you've been very patient again. Uh, Joao, you are the president of the uh, development agency in Portugal. This is the last day of the presidency uh, that you've been holding um, um, of the, um, the, 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 you know, the work you've been doing and the agenda, policy agenda you've been setting. S say to us, how do you see the work of cities um, that you've been reflecting on hearing so far fit into the forward agenda from your perspective? Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, a warm greetings, special salutation uh, from Lisbon to all members of the panel, the dear mayors, organizers, representatives of the of several institutions, participants. Uh, would like to express my gratitude for this invitation and for this, also for your question. Um, as you uh, all know, uh, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit also on a European perspective due to the fact that the uh, Today is our last day of our semester of the European Union Presidency of the Council. Uh, as you all know, uh, uh, every six months, the uh, European Union members have their own presidency, and today is the end of our semester. Very briefly, in, in the last years, we have, fortunately, in my opinion, seen the adoption of three important multilateral instruments that frame the main principles and commitments towards a more sustainable and resilient development pathways, uh, obviously the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement, and the Addis Ababa Action Plan. This is our main pillars uh, on, on uh, resilient development uh, uh, on our days, in our days. Meanwhile, development challenges have increased, uh, um, have increased greatly, uh, and so has the complexity of countries' contexts uh, all over the world, but most special in Africa. Many of the new challenges Africa countries face today are a direct consequence of climate change, which has exacerbated existing fragilities, disrupted even urban-rural linkages and balances, and undermined growth opportunities. The pandemic, as, uh, as uh, already was mentioned, the pandemic as a result of the health crisis that we all face at this moment, or we're all facing at this moment, has unfortunately presented serious challenges to the people and to the decision makers. It has affected uh, us all in a dis disproportional manner, uh, especially more vulnerable countries and regions and cities and populations. And that's why it's very important, in my opinion, it is crucial to work on a, a more efficient cities network to face challenges ahead and to reinforce uh, their, their, their voices. In this context, as my colleagues have pointed out already, uh, urbanization, poverty in Africa faces very specific challenges in increasing concentration of population in cities, particularly medium-sized cities, 
uh, threatens to exacerbate social inequalities if we don't know how to deal with that, and we have to deal with that. Um, uh, I will cite some, very briefly, I will cite some of it, OECD uh, data which estimates that Africa cities will double in population by 2050 and in less than four years from now, by 2025, Indeed. there will be 100 African cities with more than 1 million inhabitants, 100 cities. As we are discussing here now, Africa population is moving to cities and fast. Um, how to mitigate the many challenges that African urban areas are facing today and will continue to in the near future while accelerating the ecological transition in the continent uh, and sizing the opportunities of its urbanization in a quality manner has been a priority of the Portuguese presidency of the European Council during the semester that ends today, 30 of June. Portugal's motto in this context has been time for action towards a fair, green, and digital recovery. Everything is linked. We have engaged in strengthening the European Union presence all over the world, obviously, in promoting multilateralism and diversifying global partnerships, mainly with Africa, our main recipient, Portugal's recipient for development aid. Two of our flagships in our partnership with Africa during our presidency have been climate and energy transition, and human development. And human development is directly linked with the quality of life in the cities. Um, in this sense, we strengthened our support for Agenda 2063 on the African Union strategic, strategic initiatives, especially in the fields of economic integration and growth, um, involving the private sector as boosting development and job creation duly based on the green transition pillar. Uh, this is a centerpiece for the development of cities and the new narratives between the two countries. It is of paramount importance to deal and to enhance the role of the cities to face the challenge ahead, sure. but go ahead with practical solutions, mm. always with practical solutions. Obviously, the fight against climatic change will be the first priority, but we have a lot, a lot of changes to face in order to, to have our cities more, with more quality and life standards. We are so proud, in, so proud in Lisbon to be members already of the Alliance of the Mayors that exists at this, at this stage, but we have to go ahead and to enhance and reinforce our network of cities. Okay. Uh, in fact, one of the outcomes of the EU Africa Green Investment Economic Forum that we have organized during our presence was, was the decision to promote efforts to boost Africans' green transition with a relation with the cities itself and the network of the cities in Africa as an enormous opportunity to create jobs, reduce inequalities, improve health, and create sustainable livelihoods while fostering sustainable and economic growth. Very briefly is what I would like to convey to you uh, at this stage. Thank no, you. Joao, thank you very much for communicating the commitment and passion, but also the nature of the problem that we know of uh, very well. I, th I suppose the issue will be, uh, how do you, as a presidency that hands the baton onto Slovenia and then who then hands it into, into the French, is to make sure that this agenda is kept alive. And we hope, obviously not for you to react now, but whether you'll be passing this particular agenda onto the Slovenians in terms of a piece of work that they need to develop further. And as people are saying, as Mo and others have said, it's the practical action that people are looking for. What are the actual ways in which cities will be um, supported to be at the table, but also to collaborate better on a number of issues that matter, which are cross-cutting. Um, I want to move to, and thank you very much for your time, um, uh, Joao, for being with us. I want to move to Edlam. Edlam, you are um, at the United Nations uh, Commission on Africa. You're the chief there. And also, uh, very warm welcome to you. Good to have you here with us. Hello. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Yes, I Good. can. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I know that Vera Songwe couldn't be here either. So you are, you know, in a way, re re replace, not replacing, but you are speaking on her, her behalf too, or representing her, some of her views too. So given what you've heard so far, Edlam, what are your reflections on the issue of how we move forward on a practical basis? We know what the nature of the problems are, 
They're writ large. We've known that for ages. What do we need to do? No, thank you very much. And uh, yes, I am here representing Dr. Vera Songwe of uh, UNECA, the executive uh, secretary of UNECA. She sends her greetings and apologies that she couldn't be here with you. So um, it's interesting. Uh, thanks. I mean, your point around how do we how do we move forward in addressing the challenges? Mm. I actually want to challenge us to um, focus a lot more deliberately on the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know about the challenges. Of course we've been talking about the challenges of Africa's urbanization for decades now, I think, frankly speaking, it's, it's all out there. The numbers are out there. But can we challenge ourselves to talk a lot more about the fantastic, immense opportunities that lie in our cities and how we should support our local governments to unlock those opportunities? I want to take the example of informality, which is the classic example that's kind of so visibly um, described as one of the major challenges of our African cities. Of course, we have informal settlements as a major challenge and informal employment is um, widespread. But you can look at that from a different perspective as well. Think about housing and the housing deficit that we have in Africa. Estimates show that for every job, for, for every house built, up to five to six jobs can be created. And we know that in attribution comes from the housing sector. So can we talk a lot more about the opportunities? And I talk about this because if we're thinking about actions, and I think as, as Mo Ibrahim mentioned, that we want to look at practical projects and investments, there are immense opportunities. They're estimated in the billions of dollars. People yeah. are consuming differently. Even though poverty is widespread in our cities, sure. consumption is changing. So can we look at those opportunities, for instance, in food processing, the kind of food we're consuming is, is changing. What opportunities does that create for investors, both national, regional, and international? Mm -hmm. So I really urge us to shift the narrative around urbanization to focus more on opportunities. Thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, can I just highlight a couple more points? The other issue is that... I think particularly as we look at the, um, uh, the agenda setting in the region and the mm -hmm. kind of regional cooperation frameworks and agreements that are, that are being defined as we speak right now around COVID, for instance, mm -hmm. and as we think about the African continental free trade area, and of course, the, Af the AU, um, EU summit that's coming up, cities are in no way marginal or side issues. It is the agenda on the table. And I cannot emphasize this more considering that 160 million people will enter the labor market in the next 10 years in Africa. Where are those jobs going to come from? Agenda 2063 has said we want to reduce employment, unemployment by about 23, 25%. Cities are central to creating those jobs, to boosting productive job creation in our, in our country. So I think we also need to elevate the urban agenda beyond just the urban, the local, the service delivery. No, it's a national question. It's a question for the region that is absolutely critical. And now is the time. Investing in cities is expensive, but not investing in our cities will end up being more expensive for us. Thank you very much. In Edan, thank you. You're making such important points. But I just uh, I didn't get a chance to alert you. Your, your, your network was uh, uh, you know, breaking up, so we weren't able to catch the full richness of what you're saying. But your points are really well made about shifting the dynamic to opportunity rather than challenge. And that thing about how do you create markets with social purpose? Um, and really, that's a real key issue, of whether it's housing or other matters. Um, rather than being a land grab, you can create market making with a social purpose. That's what we've learned. Um, so thank you very much for that. I want to go to Tarie. If I hope I pronounced your name correctly. From the Women, Women's Leadership Network. Tarie? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Hello. how are you? Yes. I'm fine, thank you. Warm welcome. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. No worries. Um, you've been, you know, you're, you're part of the Women's Leadership Network. Um, give us your reflections 
on uh, what you've heard so far uh, and, and what the role the Women's Leadership Network can play. And we've, we're there, you know, there's a growth in women mayors across the world as well, which we know. It's no longer a male dominant, well, predominantly male dominant agenda, but there are more women making inroads at a local level, we know. But from your perspective um, and the work you do on infrastructure investment, what's, what's, what are your reflections to what you've heard so far? Building on what Ed Lam has just said about, you know, looking at chat opportunities rather than challenges. Absolutely. Well, let me introduce myself, my, my firm specifically. Um, I'm Tarie Badigeshin, Chief Executive Officer of ARM Harris Infrastructure Fund Managers, an infrastructure private equity fund based in Lagos, investing in West Africa. I'm dialing in from Lagos, and I can assure you it's very active and exciting out there, though I don't have the background images for you. Um, I'd, I'd like to speak about our keen interest in urban infrastructure, especially from a climate perspective, so much so that some of our ideas around solutions for climate-based infrastructure for African urban centers was selected as one of the top six ideas by the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance in San Francisco for their accelerator. And so it, I'm proud to share that our fund is actually working with the global community to solve for financial innovation to support climate infrastructure for African cities. And a lot of our work um, in this area comes from the opportunities that we're seeing in African cities, as well as ways we can solve for them. We manage capital from domestic pension funds, as well as the international community. And what we note is that a lot of the bankable opportunities for infrastructure, especially those with a climate link, are in urban centers. And the reason for that is that the urban centers present the, a significant contribution ah, to the national you. GDP. Ah. I'd like to share some data with you. If you just to be Can aware, you your, your connections, your, again, you're coming out with fabulous stuff, but we miss you every now and again because of the link. But let's, let's, let's carry on. Let's carry on. Okay, all right, no problem at all. Um, I'd, I'd also aim to go into a, another link if uh, that would make it uh, better as well. Sometimes the phones are better, so I'll, I'll carry on. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd like to share some data with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, let's see. Recording in progress. Okay, this, okay. You are transitioning to mobile. You're muted. So, Taria, I need you to unmute yourself, if you can hear me. All right. Lovely. Let's try again. Okay. All right. Effortless All right. transition. Thank you. Go on. Let's share some data. Nigeria has a GDP of about $400 billion. Um, uh, dollars. And of that, Lagos is $110 billion and contributes about 17% of the GDP. The top four Nigerian cities contribute 25% of the GDP for $116 billion. Ghana, uh, Accra contributes about 50% of the GDP of Ghana. Cote d'Ivoire, um, um, Abidjan to Cote d'Ivoire, 44%. And Freetown, about 24% of the GDP of, um, um, of Sierra Leone. Now, imagine if you took out the commodity-based GDPs from these countries, mm. how much cities would be contributing to the GDP. Indeed. Because a lot of that is from economic activities such as services, digital, financial services, and the non-commodity-based um, 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 economic activity. And a lot of that is actually where poverty alleviation comes from because you have a significant number of jobs that comes out of the rural area, about, uh, out of the urban areas. You have industrialization, you have uh, manufacturing. There's a lot of focus by the global community on rural. But let us also point out that the more the rural areas develop when they have access to the internet, they see the advancement in the cities and they migrate to the cities. Mm. We talk about migration the pressure that the cities are under as a result of rural migration to where there's some baseline electrification um, job opportunities is putting a significant amount of pressures on cities. Now, as has been said earlier, West African cities are on the front lines of climate change, either from coastal exposure or being Sahelian, which means they are affected by flood or drought, respectively. 
Now, while Africa has the lowest carbon emissions per capita, the cities are going to have the potential to contribute the greatest to CO2, especially with links to industry. And so without the greening of cities, we're expecting this to increase, but also adaptation and resilience for cities is really crucial. And for this, we see great opportunities. We see the opportunities in mitigation infrastructure as well as adaptation infrastructure. We're seeing opportunities today in terms of our pipeline, in terms of energy efficiency, be it interconnected mini grids, mini grids or embedded energy generation for the slum areas mm. and that also involve um, 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 livelihood or productive use. And there's a lot of opportunities for energy efficiency in commercial and in industrial energy to make cities more, to make cities greener. We need to talk about alternative transportation, lots of opportunities to decongest cities. The data that shows that even just by adding bridges into a lot of the cities for which there is significant con congestion will improve um, and um, um, will reduce emissions. Yesterday, we talked about clean cooking. We don't need to go into any, that much more, but suffice to say, there are a significant number of emissions and pollution that's coming from um, um, dirty cooking. There's also circular economy opportunities around mm. industrialization. We'd like to touch on adaptation as well. Um, I think a lot of the mayors on the call will note that a lot of cities were all, almost ran out of food during the pandemic exactly. because cities were fed by the rural areas. Mm. And so adaptation for cities is really about strengthening food security, especially as linked to rural areas. So if for, from our perspective, being able to invest in road infrastructure, processing, and ways to build food resilience as linked to rural areas is actually a climate challenge. But why is it so difficult to finance cities? It's been mm. talked about. The financing of subnationals is a big challenge because the multilateral and DFI community engage with sovereigns. Their mm. preferred creditor status is with sovereigns, their programs are with sovereigns, and their lending is to sovereigns. So it's very important that subnationals, led predominantly by mayors, governors, and the like, become part of the national the national conversation as linked to DFI. There are some DFIs that have subnational um, strategies. AFD is an example of that, where they're seeking to partner with subnationals. We need more DFIs to make subnational financing part of their mission, and to extend that to mayors, but to link it with national strategies, because we cannot change DFIs overnight, but we can stretch their mandates. They will always need to work with sovereigns, but we need to bring the subnationals into that conversation. The sure. challenge Tari, Tari, can, I just, can I stop you there, because you're making such a really powerful, important point about money, because money matters on this agenda. And we've heard that. We've heard that from Mohammed. We've heard it from Elsa. And infrastructure is going to be key. The quality, the greenness, the digitalness of, of infrastructure is going to be the pathway for success for a lot of Africa and a lot of Europe. Do you envisage the possibility of creating a financial instrument that cuts across regions, but cut undercuts, not undercuts, sorry, but cuts across the DFI? Is it not possible for the capital markets to create a financial instrument that supports mayors to access finance based on the return of investment that you just demonstrated of their GDP share? That's what we're trying to build. Okay. <laughs> Great. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're trying to build, but it involves innovation, and that's why we need support. And so that is actually why the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance selected us, because we're seeking to find a way to create a partnership across DFIs, um, private capital, capital markets, and subnationals to solve for climate infrastructure Great. for urbanization. However, it requires blended finance, mm. blended finance is more cutting edge. There aren't existing tools. There aren't existing frameworks, but there are ingredients. And we can work with the ingredients that we have that have been used in different forms of microcosms to hopefully create something scalable. But yes, we need practical solutions. We need action. And given that we have to make a return, mm -hmm. we are focused on deploying and to actually be raising that fund and structuring it in the next year or so. Terry, thank you. Um, uh, of course you would be working on something, given what you've been saying. Um, and I'm sorry if I stopped you from saying more about it, because that's, it seems like that seems a logical conclusion, to create the, mo the better economic uh, instrument that actually works in a way that supports 
uh, uh, cities more effectively. Uh, and thank you for, for uh, seamlessly building on what Edlan was saying about looking at the opportunity rather than the challenge. And you set out a myriad set of opportunities. And we need more um, investment um, people from the, uh, from the market that think like you ultimately. And that's one of the issues that we don't get many venture capitalists and, you know, people who work on the markets to think creatively with a social purpose in the way that you're just describing. And we need more of them uh, cluttered around this particular agenda. I'm almost run out of time. I have five or six minutes left. Um, uh, I want to ask if anyone has a burgeoning issue or question they want to raise. Before I go back to uh, perhaps um, have another chap at, uh, to, at uh, uh, Yvonne and or if Mo wants to come back. Martin, so you wanted to come back, I believe. Yes, I just wanted to pick up on this conversation we just had about opportunities, but also most important challenge about the fact that we cannot afford and we shouldn't really be complacent and just have a talking shop and really uh, look at um, uh, practical solutions. And I just want to point all of us to what I see as a particular issues that I think together we could try to address. That is that when working with cities, there is not much talking. There is a lot, there is always a lot of actions and there is a lot of innovation, a lot of experimentation, a lot of pilots and a lot of initiatives that are worth scaling up and testing further. A key challenge is that a lack of infrastructure and system to generate the learning and to create the opportunities for that to happen risk creating a lot of action that remains a series of projects rather than something that really elevates and creates the influence that we need, or in fact the potential um, economic returns that you know that we all we can all see are there to be made. And so in really thinking about pushing this agenda forward is how do we build on all this action that, mm -hmm. that is happening on financing, on political engagement, on mayors coming together and creating platform for actions to really make the most of this energy and vision and pragmatism to engage, um, you know, whether it is with political processes or with sort of sustainable change, because there is a lot of action. The risk here is that it remains, you know, a series of projects or innovations on the ground um, and it's, it's on all of us uh, to make the most of these opportunities of which I very much agree with Edlam there are really plenty and largely untapped. Absolutely Marta thank you it's, it's more about actually how do you scale that movement and make it a movement maker and a changer of some of these multilateral uh, international processes. We have two hands up and I'll take both of you before I conclude the uh, the event so um, forgive me if I pronounce your name cor incorrectly is Ak Akiri or Achiri? It's Achiri. Achiri. Welcome. Please yeah. introduce yourself and your whether it's a question or a comment. All right. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, I'm really very pleased to be a part of this um, conversation. I think that all the speakers have really um, made um, brilliant con um, um, contributions. And I think the work of the Africa Europe Foundation is really necessary having these debates. And I think and hope that these debates are going to lead to um, more fruitful um, um, and policies. I'm a PhD candidate of international relations, specifically working on refugees. Um, I also um, I'm a co-founder of an of an NGO which um, protects um, international students in Cyprus, and also I'm a co-founder of a think tank called Stop the War in Cameroon Coalition. Um, trying to um, propose solutions to end the war in Cameroon. I've also written a couple of papers on the EU-Africa relationship, and okay. I'm, I'm an EU project expert. Um, mm -hmm. I think that my, my my comment, it's a question and a comment at the same time, in the sense that in the latest paper um, I um, co-authored on, on the EU-African relationship, we were arguing that it is that it is time to renegotiate the EU African partnership. And this renegotiation of the EU African partnership has to do with the asymmetrical nature of of the current relationship. And do, when doing the research for this paper, um, we we did realize that um, a lot of the time um, Africa is trying to um, replicate what is happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, it is not always successful. And I get the, the sense or the feeling that um, the whole conversation on cities is, up, is about African cities replicating what um, has been successful in European cities. And that may not necessarily be the right way to okay. go. When we look yeah. at the... The, the burgeoning um, and population coming in Africa, perhaps we need to reevaluate um, our social organizational um, structures within the African continent. And maybe cities may not be the right way to go. Maybe there is some other form of 
of social organization. Um, I'm hoping to, to uh, hear any th perhaps Thank any you. I, I'm running out of time, so I do declare, but thank you for bringing in such a provocative thought at this stage. And it'll be, it'll be great if I get time to bring Yvonne back, uh, someone who is a city mayor, to see whether actually the, your, your point is valid from her perspective. But uh, one thing to, you know, to, it is thought provoking that we shouldn't let, you know, lose sight of key questions like that. We have Sobata. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello. I am, Sobata from, Sorry. I am Sobata from Botswana. Uh -huh. I am an event planner by profession. And I'm the 2021 Mo Ibrahim Leadership Fellow attached to the ECA. Um, we have had interesting discussions. And one thing that uh, triggered me to comment was the need for practical solutions. And I want to make this as a takeaway point. Uh, as we are sitting here, I can never think of any funding of a project that doesn't happen in a city or in a village or in a locality. So going forward to make this practical, why can't we make it a provision that whatever the development that, that is being funded by the multilateral organizations, there has to be a provision for the mayor of such a city where that development is going to take place to have a provision to pen down his signature. And if we have that provision for mayors to be sitting at the negotiation table for funding of such a project, then I think we, we can be practical. Because when you think of funding a, a national government, it's only at the lower le at the upper level, sorry, where everybody pens down his signature for a, a, a development funding. And I have never seen where a mayor is also invited to the, 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 the signatory table to pen his signature. So let, to make it practical. Absolutely. If, it's, if it is a financing for a project, there's never been a project that happens without taking place in a locality or a city. Let it be the mayor or the council chairperson or whoever who pens down his signature or become part of that bilateral agreement. Thank you. Sabata, thank you so much. And also building on, obviously, you can see why you're one of, you're one of the Mo Ibrahim uh, young leaders, that, you know, very practical suggestion, you build on that point. And that, that thing about creating a city clause in national funding or international funding, what a good idea. It builds on the notion of social clauses that governments use to fund the private sector. Why not have a city clause in funding relationships? Um, I want to now move, I have two, very quick, and I, I'm really sorry that I have to ask you to be so short in your contribution. Manal, you've had your, your hand up uh, for some time. Briefly introduce yourself and what your question or query is. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aman al I'm, I'm a medical doctor and fresh graduate of diplomacy. Um, my question is, I did my research on Europe-Africa uh, joint initiatives on migration. And during my research, um, like from this discussion, I just remembered that certain national strategies that were carried out by, uh, by Europe, especially like, for example, in Nigeria, did have like a negative impact on cities, especially cities which were dependent on migrants uh, mobility within the country. So it could be a recommendation or a comment that maybe uh, national strategies should focus on how the impact would be on a short and midterm uh, on the cities rather than just uh, the, the regional or the national development. Thank you very much. Manal, whereabouts are you, by the way? You didn't say where you're currently based. Uh, I come from Algeria. But you're, are you in Algeria right now? No, currently I am in Turkey. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, it just gives us a good idea about the, the range of people we have uh, attending from all over the world. Thank you for that comment. And you make the point right that why shouldn't national strategies have a risk assessment or a risk assess or a risk as, uh, uh, impact assessment on cities as a very specific way of looking at strategies that are being developed nationally. Finally, uh, again, my, my apologies if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Polia, Polsia. Hello, you're on mute. Yeah, it's Polycap. Can you hear Polycap. me? Polycap, absolutely. Thank you very much. Warm welcome. Briefly, your comment. And okay, yourself. thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm called Mudo Polycap Mudo. I'm a PhD research student uh, in the post you know, um, Church University. So, um, actually, I'm also very much delighted to be part of this event. And um, I want to appreciate the, 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 the speakers. But my question, to be very quick, is that what, what future of city is Europe planning for Africa? Because it appears what they are transferring to Africa, it's probably what they have used and it has worked for them. And I believe Europe is moving forward. 
So I just want to know what future of CIT are they trying to bring? Is it what they have used already, or it is what they are also envisaging? Let's say for the next 50 years, is the same thing they are taking to Africa, or I don't know. That's just my question. Polycap, Polycap, thank you very much. If I had time, I would have asked you, what kind of city do you want in the future? Because actually, that's part of the dialogue we need to be having. And it goes, that's why I want to end with Yvonne, uh, because you spoke about the need, and a lot, of the, a lot of the contributors, in a way, spoke about, we need to think about reimagining that unit of governance, that municipality, that city, and what it does in the future, what it, how it will behave and what it should do, given we have these dramatic challenges of climate, digitalization, urbanization, and the importance of green and digital infrastructure. We need, we need to reimagine cities, no? Yvonne, back to you. Thank you very much. And I want to just start off by saying, we should not be asking Europe no. what sort of cities they want for Africa. These exactly. are these are our cities, and we define our cities. Um, and the, the the statement made earlier on that it sounds as if we're trying to recreate what Europe has is absolutely not correct. I work with many mayors across the continent, and our solutions have to be solutions for where we find ourselves today, a very complex and different environment to the one which saw European cities evolve over hundreds of years. We are city, seeing urbanization and the doubling of our populations in the, in the space of a decade, sometimes two decades. And the challenge is that um, living in a time of climate crisis, living in a time of pandemics, the challenge that these pose to our cities are unique. It's like nothing that's ever happened before. And the only solution that we have we can have is a solution that we create, a solution that comes bottom up from our people. So in working on that, let me give some examples. So when you talk about spatial planning, this is an area of major deficit for many African cities because as actually it comes to a governance issue. There's been a real pull for centralization of power. Um, and we know that city development has got to be local. And, and because we've had the centralization, it's meant that urban planning is something that's been missing in many of our cities. So we've ended up with these sprawls where we've got a predominance of informal settlements. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, Mayor Sowa said earlier, um, a high degree of informality. How do you tap into that from the perspective of actually improving the spatial experience? Because improving spatial experience also improves economic productivity, Indeed. also improves access to health, also increases job. So, but you can't do it, you can't retrofit uh, an urban plan now. So how do you do this in, in, in sort of segments working with, and we're seeing that happening, working with residents to actually map out what they have, des design what they need, but then also having the city come above that um, and take into consideration some of the climate issues. So reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions from the real terrible traffic congestion we see in many of our cities. We're looking at introducing a cable car in Freetown, which will, which will cut down um, um, travel time, but also reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. How do we ensure that when we look at something as critical as waste management, a challenge in many of our cities, that we don't go down the European model of having some big um, waste management company with its big trucks moving around our streets. We don't have the streets for them to move around. In Freetown, we're working on a micro enterprise model, which has created over 2000 jobs for young people. It's small tricycle carts that can move into our informal settlement that can ensure that we're increasing waste collection. Um, we're also empowering young people, giving them the job, and they're building those jobs. These are just some examples, but I Excellent. want to just conclude by saying the African solution has got to be just that, an African solution. But we've got to do it. We've got to think about it, knowing that this tension still exists, knowing that there are many of our governments who continue to want to hold, centralize functions which should be local functions. And it's a failure to devolve, which has also resulted in the failure to implement. Because those who are closest to the, to the situation, in my city, for example, bizarrely, although the Local Government Act of 2004 gives power to the city for urban planning and building permit issuance, it is still done at the central level with devastating consequences, both environmentally, as well as aesthetically, as well as in terms of sanitation, fire, fire force, uh, 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 firefighting, and so on. So I will land where um, Sabatha started, that we really need to begin to use leverage 
every leverage we have, including that of access to funding at the national level to ensure that the things that matter um, are factored into what the national governments are doing in terms of releasing powers, mandates, and authorities to the local councils. Yvonne, brilliantly said. Thank you. Uh, and a fitting co uh, conclusion to this conversation. I was, I was watching uh, Mo's face and he was kind of nodding. And I was wondering, what, Bo, did you want to come in very briefly? Because you were kind of, you were thinking, yes, she's saying the right things at last. So, you know, in terms of the kind of issues that we need to, and it's not just about you. Uh, there is something about the, the purpose of Africa-EU connection should, shouldn't be about replicating it's about learning across fertilizing and knowing that the challenges are similar across the world surely what covid's taught us is the un you know the unity of our both the consequences on us but also some of the solutions mo do you want to say some final word from you uh, right i think uh, my sister yvonne said it all really indeed uh, she, uh, that's excellent and uh, we, we must cooperate <laughs> And uh, talking to others is not about copying. It is just about understanding how people go around solving problems. Uh, and African mayors also should speak to each other, not just to European exactly, uh, indeed. mayors. So this kind of conversation we need to have between everybody, really. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do something really unusual. I want to thank you for moderating uh, this session. I think you did it nicely. And <laughs> I think uh, uh, usually you upload the speakers, uh, but I'm going to upload you besides the speakers today. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Mo, that's very, very sweet of you. That's very kind of you. You've embarrassed thank me. You. No, thank you very much. Um, that was very sweet. That's kind of set me off track a little bit. But thank you. That was very kind of you. Um, and it's a pleasure. I love these things, especially when we get the opportunity to engage this kind of audience and have this interaction. Thank you all for being here. This is the end of day three. We move tomorrow to talk about young people and we'll talk with, not to, uh, with young people. We've got hundreds of young people joining us for a youth, a special youth dialogue about platforms of platforms around young people. And that should be a really exciting opportunity to really hear directly firsthand about what young people want. This is not about kind of voyeurism. This is about really understanding and asking the tough question, what do you want? What do you expect? What are your ambitions of the relationship between Africa and Europe, but also about the summits and those multilateral things that are happening in the years to come? What is that thing that young people want? And finally, we have a special media broadcast of two superstars. We have uh, Mary Robinson and Ellen, Sir, uh, Ellen Johnson Salif, both international stars in a special media broadcast that will be done, that will be done on Friday um, as both women who are but, uh, the uh, let me get this right they're the honorary presidents of the Africa Europe Foundation and so it'll be an opportunity to really hear from them and the reflections on what they've witnessed so far this week but also as two very wise owls what they think is ahead of us and what we should do thank you all very much for being with us we've really i hope you've enjoyed this um, mind your distance keep safe and see you very soon again online at another africa eu foundation event and also a friends of europe event take care bye bye <laughs>